Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 26. Listen to hear a word from God. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them as a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on the mountains, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. God, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My name is Rachel Boris, and I'm a senior at Unionville High School. My name is Wesley Flynn, and I'm a senior at Baird Rustin High School. As John said, initially, Rachel and I were going to preach on March 15th, but due to recent circumstances, Youth Sunday had to be rescheduled. With that being said, we are honored that we get to preach on Mother's Day, but our scripture lesson really has nothing to do with mothers. So, we want to take the time now to wish you Happy Mother's Day. In the scripture lesson that Riley has kindly read for us, we see Jesus, a Jew, talking to a Samaritan woman, two groups who used to be one and are now divided due to political and religious tension. John describes the woman as being married five times, something that is incredibly taboo for this time. But Jesus doesn't let any of these differences impact the way that he treats her. As we read in the story, it brought up many experiences that Rachel and I have had over the years. The summer before my freshman year of high school, I was offered a chance of a lifetime to celebrate midsummer with my best friend Evelina Berg and her family in Sweden. Needless to say, I went. The first few days I spent out in Nortelia, where the Berg's grandmother lived. While out in the country visiting, I learned that their grandmother, Margareta, was part of a committee that worked to integrate immigrants into Sweden. During those first few days out in Nortelia, I talked a lot with Margareta. I learned about Sweden's history with refugees and that the country was taking in more immigrants than it could house, which led to many problems. In October of 2015, there were 10,000 refugees arriving each week in Sweden. Sweden was expected to take in as many as 190,000 refugees, equivalent to 2% of its 9.5 million population, according to the publication Foreign Policy. When I was there, I saw refugees living on the streets and women and children sitting with signs asking for money. 
As of 2016, when I visited, the Swedish people were not used to this, from what I was told, because the country had never really experienced much homelessness. When I was talking to Margareta, I learned in, that in her role, she helped refugees find homes, even if she herself was the one providing shelter. For instance, there was a Syrian family living on Margareta's property, just three houses over, the same property where we were staying. The next day, over breakfast, Evelina and I asked Margareta if we could meet the Syrian family she was housing. With a resounding yes from her, we walked the half mile over to their cottage. After nervously knocking, the front door flew open to reveal a man with a huge smile on his face. A simple introduction ensued in which I met the parents Assam and Samira, the son Tariq, and the daughters Sedra, Salam, and Anas, all shown in the picture. The differences between all of us became very noticeable. For instance, the Syrian family didn't speak Swedish or English, and Evelina and I didn't speak Arabic. With this considerable challenge facing Rachel and Evelina, they didn't give up because they knew the conversation to come would be significant to understanding an experience so different from their own. So Evelina and I overcame the language barrier by pointing to pictures on a phone and using what little Swedish the Syrian family understood to ask them yes or no questions. It wasn't the easiest conversation, but it was worth the struggle. During our visit with the Syrian refugees, the Muslim holiday Ramadan was occurring, meaning no food for anyone from sunup to sundown. When we arrived, the wife Samira and eldest son Tariq immediately went to the kitchen to begin preparing a Syrian version of pita and a Fanta-like drink for us. When they offered us the food, we didn't know what to do because they weren't allowed to eat until sundown, but we didn't want to be rude and refuse. The selflessness the Syrian family showed me through its simple gesture humbled me. In the scripture, we heard that Jesus offers the living water to the woman. While his offering of the water, not literal, it is still significant. Jesus' actions show us that the differences, whatever they may be, should not stop us from being kind to one another. While the Syrians offered us an actual meal, the offering significance was not any different than Jesus's. The Syrian family offered us time, hospitality, and graciousness. They could have refused. They could have grouped us in with the other Europeans that declined them asylum and treated them poorly. They could have treated us differently for our language or religion like many Europeans do to them, but they didn't. The gift of living water is really about welcoming pe other people and not judging them for their differences. Like Rachel's experience of the Syrians offering her and her friend food, the disciples urged Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. Jesus, in his usual cryptic manner, responds, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Of course, the disciples are very confused. There are two different types of nourishment being addressed here, spiritual and nutritional. We've all been hungry before. After a long day of work or school, you can't wait to get home and eat that leftover pasta from last night. However, have you ever noticed that when you're famished, the nutritious foods aren't what you crave? Man, what a long day of school. I could really go for a quinoa salad right now. <laughs> no, it's the Oreos and potato chips that get swallowed up first. The calorie-dense, fatty, sugary foods become almost irresistible. Jesus makes this comparison to nutritional and spiritual hunger because the feeling of spiritual hunger isn't as prominent as the feeling of an empty stomach. Yet the consequential indulgence is the same. It's like eating a whole box of Oreos. Not like Wes or I have ever done that before. <laughs> sure, you're not hungry anymore, but in a little bit, you might regret acting impulsively. When we act selfishly and without respect, it's a good sign our souls need some more nutritious food. I personally have a weakness when it comes to my workshop. I get homework, essays to write, a room to clean, but nothing seems quite as important as whatever project I'm working on. This escape ends up creating a lot of stress later when all my assignments need to be submitted. Then, when I get stressed, I have less patience to listen to my sister playing trombone in the adjacent room, and then everybody gets upset. <laughs> so what is the spiritual nourishment that we all seek? Well, Jesus says it right here. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to complete his work. Acting with kindness, love, and compassion, 
provides the satisfaction that we try to replace with spiritual junk food. Jesus also alludes to how this can work communally. One sows, another reaps. Wes and I believe the labor Jesus is referring to is the will of God, and the reaping being the kindness that others have extended to the disciples, which we see in my experience in Sweden. Jesus and his disciples are about to be welcomed into Galilee, yet they have done nothing to deserve this hospitality. They are reaping that which they did not labor. Jesus wants us to keep our souls healthy by loving one another. Through God, we will be shown the same love, even when we don't necessarily deserve it. The concept of spiritual nourishment immediately had me thinking about service work, going out of your way and contributing your work somewhere that may not even affect you. In my family, we try to make service a regular part of what we do. Working as close to Philly to all the way down in Mexico, we've had a diverse set of experiences. For example, last year, I went on the Credo Philly Project as a youth leader. Nothing like spending a weekend with a bunch of eighth grade boys. <laughs> Our second day in Philly, we were tasked with street clean duty. My personal job became the safety coordinator, which basically meant I got to wear a fluorescent yellow vest and made sure none of the boys in our group hurt each other. A little bit more challenging than you might expect. While our supervisor from the Philly Project organization was looking for tools, I was discouraging the log jumping contest my group was having on the decorative tree stumps on the sidewalk. <laughs> the shenanigans finally came to an end when I had to catch somebody who, over, who overshot their stump. And we all decided it would just be best to sit on the stumps instead. <laughs> Just as everyone was doing so, I startled as I felt a large hand pat me on the back. I looked behind me and saw a tall, burly Philly guy, and he said, I don't know who you are, but you're one heck of a guy. And walked away with his friends. <laughs> I was so confused. I don't know what he saw that inspired him to say that, but it made my day. And more importantly, it gave me a connection to the area we were cleaning and made our work feel a bit more tangible. This spiritual, nurture, this spiritual nourishment I got from volunteering in Philly can also come from pushing yourself just to be someone better. Enjoying a walk or run in the park, starting a devotional, trying a new hobby, or pursuing a passion further. Although gratifying tasks, they're not the easiest to start. In this time of spiritual confusion and restlessness, we could all use a little extra quinoa salad. <laughs> Whether we are in Sweden, Mexico, Philly, or stuck at home here in Chester County, we want to take the opportunity to encourage you to be kind, especially in a time when we all have apprehension and anxiety over what's going on. Particularly right now, humanity needs to come together across whatever divides us to get through this uncertainty. Ultimately, the compassion that we share begins through God's love for us, which we portray through our individual actions. We want to bring our satisfied spirits to whatever challenges are presented to us.